Today, we went out to meet with a couple of different families. The first one I want you to meet, a mother and father. Their young kid, 23, he just turned. Hirsch, he's known by his friends. He goes to the festival. He's having a great time. This happens. And you'll see pictures and videos tonight of what, exactly what happened there. He's in a bomb shelter. They are throwing grenades into the bomb shelter. His friend is grabbing them and throwing them back. Some get through. They believe that this kid has part of his arm blown off. He's trained as a medic. He puts a tourniquet on. He survives it. The terrorists then say, if you can walk, get up, after people all around him have been killed. And you will see tonight what that looked like in real time. He then is taken. And now his family is desperately trying to get him back and has a message for Hamas and for you. Here it is. We've got like a little mission control. Command center. Going yeah. here. We just were putting away stuff that's sort of sensitive because we keep a huge whiteboard because this is our situation room. We're doing here everything that not everyone can do right now because when your house is on fire, you've got to spread out and, you know, try to control what's happening. So I think the whole country is trying to do that. What we're about right now is, of course, we want our son and hostages released. That's not even where we are right now. We know from witness testimony that our son's arm was blown off by a grenade. He's a medic, and he was able to put a bandage on himself. He tourniqueted but it. Since Saturday morning, he has been with an arm blown off, and we have no idea if he's getting anybody to treat it. Have you so, seen any sign of him? Is any no. of this video that came out? No. You just know from people we, who we are know with from, him. Right. He Survivors was, he was, from the bomb shelter he that he was in. He was in an outdoor bomb shelter with 25 to 30 people packed into it. The story that we pieced together is based on speaking to others who survived and were pulled out of the bomb shelter later in the day, way after him. So we know that he has a critical wound. And so for us, we feel that because it's a humanitarian issue, that we want to make sure that he's getting medical treatment. Um, immediately, because you can bleed out, infection. I'm not thinking it's like the cleanest place where he was in the bomb shelter where he got the wound. I don't know where he is now, but that's what's concerning us the most is that time is ticking and it's very, it's a very dangerous situation. How are you able to function and do all this? I could say that I have terrible thoughts. I'm worried about myself. I'm worried about Rachel and our girls. But my number one thought right now is whatever we're experiencing, the, the trauma that we're going through, for him, it's 100 times worse. All I'm thinking about is he's not able to sit on a couch and relax for a minute. He's not able to have a cup of coffee. He is in distress. And that's the good scenario. All that motivates me is let's get him help. How did and he come to be taken? So once it quieted down, because I think they had, they had killed a lot of people, they had critically wounded a lot of people, um, they came in, uh, we were told, uh, with their guns and said, anyone who can stand up and walk, come out. And so five people stood up and went out, and Hirsch was one of them. You said it's surreal when you heard that Hirsch was one of the people who was involved in this. Could you even believe it? I instantly knew when I read the text that he wrote that he was in trouble. Because What did it say? So there were two texts that had come in at 8-11, both of them. And the first one said, I love you. And the second one said, I'm sorry. And so I knew something terrible was about to happen to him. Because as much as he loves us, he doesn't at 8, 11, on normal mornings, write, I love you. And the fact that he wrote, I'm sorry, I, I took immediately to mean something really bad is going to happen to me, and it's going to cause you a lot of pain. That's how I took it immediately, immediately. How do you deal with who has him and what their intentions seems, seem to be? How, how are you holding that in your head and your heart? 
Well, it's very hard to understand um, in terms of, that's what I keep wondering. Like what, I don't understand the goal. I don't understand the method. So I don't know who I'm really dealing with. I don't know who he's dealing with. Like as a mother, I just think to myself, everyone in Gaza has a mother. Like maybe there's a mother somewhere there, wherever he is, who can just say, if this was my son in another area that wasn't my country and he was wounded and alone, I can tell you that I would take care of that person. I don't care who they are. I don't care what, if their beliefs are different than my beliefs, I actually really truly would take care of them. And I hope that there's a mother wherever Hirsch is that's thinking, we're people, we're all people. Let me take care of this boy that could easily be my boy. I mean, I really believe, I wanna believe he'll be evacuated as an American civilian who is critically wounded in a, in a foreign country. And I really feel a lot of confidence in President Biden and the State Department and everyone in America who we have been in touch with has been wonderful. What do you want the people who may have your son to know? Well, just like you have a mother, Hirsch has a mother. And I'd like for him to come home and be with his mother. And I'd like him to get the medical treatment that he needs. And I'd like to understand truly what can we do so that in the whole world we're not having these kind of situations? I'm not sure that Israel is perfect. I know that it never goes into civilian communities where people are sleeping, where people are having fun in nature, and grabs them and shoots at them and beheads them and does all these torturous things in masked people. No, Israel doesn't do that. The threats that if Israel invades, that they're going to use the hostages as payback for that. How do you handle that when it seems there is going to be an invasion? Right. I mean, it's terrifying, obviously. There's nothing more precious to us than him. Um, and I really am able to say the whole entire country is in jeopardy right now on many fronts. And I am hopeful and believe that the Army will do its best with whatever information it has. What is sustaining your hope that Hirsch is alive and that you'll get him back? I mean, all these people around us who keep saying, we're doing everything we can, we're gonna, you know, you have to keep the faith, you have to keep the hope, and it's the only choice. We have to just keep walking. You know, there's that old saying, when you're in hell, keep walking. Because otherwise you're just staying in hell. What has been the hardest part so far? Um, every single part. It's surreal. It's, you know, people keep coming in and saying, how are you? And I say, well, picture your mother and picture her knowing that you're either dead or kidnapped without an arm. That's how I'm doing. That's how we're doing. That's Rachel Goldberg. Her husband is Jonathan Poland. They're from Virginia. These are our people. You're an American audience. It is so close to home. When I showed up at their house, the guy who answered the door, I played basketball with in New York City for years. I didn't know he knew them. That's how close we are to this. These are Americans. Tony Blinken's on the ground right now, our Secretary of State. He should be meeting with these families to give them some sense of hope that anything here but the worst is possible. 
All right, let's bring in Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Cornricus. Uh, he is an IDF spokesperson. Thank you very much, Colonel, for joining us. I just have a couple of quick questions, and then I have a request at the end. Uh, how concerned are you that Hamas has not given any indication that they're treating the people that they have captured as hostages? Thank you for having me. Um, and I saw the previous story, and I'm actually still thinking about it. Uh, we are very concerned uh, because uh, we've seen the atrocities, the brutality, the calculated way in which Hamas planned this activity to go into Israel to butcher civilians uh, in their homes, at the music festival, all over southern Israel, and then take hostages and, and, and go back. Uh, unfortunately, and it hurts me to say, there is no logical, let's say, there's no reason for us to assume that they are indeed treating them uh, humanely or fairly. And sadly, on the contrary, I have heard reports on what befell these poor Israelis on the way into Gaza, including very graphic videos of uh, an Israeli girl being uh, manhandled and pushed into a vehicle with blood on her trousers and many other horrible things that I'd rather not speak about. So sadly, I'd say that the working assumption, this being a, a horrible terrorist organization, the working assumption is that no. Uh, Colonel, Friday, you have Hamas calling for Muslims uh, to come to the region, what they're calling the Al-Aqsa flood, uh, obviously a reference uh, to the controversy surrounding the mosque in Jerusalem. Uh, how concerned are you that Friday is a pivotal day in the course of what happens here? Well, you know, Hamas has been using all of their media outlets and all of their surrogates and Al Jazeera and the others in trying to incite uh, Palestinians in Judea and Samaria, Arabs in Israel, Palestinians in Lebanon, and all over the region. And they've been doing that since midday Saturday. So this isn't new. This is just a new theme that they're uh, rallying around. Uh, so far, uh, there hasn't been, you know, a real uh, response on the ground. Palestinians in Judea and Samaria have not answered Hamas's call, and neither have Palestinians in uh, Lebanon or in other locations. This doesn't mean that uh, we shouldn't be extremely vigilant towards what's happening, but I am just saying that Hamas has really been trying to create this uh, uh, situation where there's war on all fronts, where there's a general uprising against Israelis. That has not happened. And we have greatly enhanced our troops in Judea and Samaria, strengthened the defense of the communities there in order to prevent exactly the scenes that we're seeing on the screen here, where armed terrorists are able to overrun the defenses and get into a community and massacre people there. Of course, we want to provide, we want to uh, defend against that. Right. So uh, it's a scenario, it's a, it's a risk and it needs to be mitigated. Um, Colonel, we, we know today that there was a head fake from Hezbollah sending over uh, some probes to see what the response would be, and all of our screens lit up with air raid warnings. Uh, we know that you have troops there and that you're preparing uh, for it. I'm going to let you go because I know how busy you are. I appreciate you taking the time, and I have a simple request. Please, we'll be in contact right after the show. Please let me go with your people so that I can show my audience the reality on the ground of where the fighting is active so that they get uh, that this isn't something that has happened, but that it is happening right now. Sure thing. We will see it done. Colonel, thank you very much, and thank you for spending the time. All right, now I want to bring in uh, a military expert, Colonel uh, Brendan Kearney, uh, worked with IDF, retired Marine colonel, a former chief of staff for the U.S. Marines in Europe, understands this area, served in Desert Storm. Uh, thank you very much, Colonel, for joining us. This is a uh, very tricky with those who are captured. Uh, they're already in an urban setting in Gaza. You can't roll heavy and hard in there. We live this reality, obviously, in our war on terror. How difficult would it be uh, for the Israeli force, as formidable as they are, to go in with the hope of getting these people back? Uh, Chris, uh, always good to be with you. Um, you asked some great questions, and the answer is it's very, very difficult. But if there's a military in the world 
that can handle this type of situation, these type of challenges very, very well, I would handle uh, or I would look to the Israelis to be able to do it. Um, it's not going to be easy. They may not be successful. The hostages, uh, in some cases, may not survive. But the reality is uh, their Israelis are good at what they do. And uh, if I was a hostage, I'd be, I'd be thrilled to know that the Israelis are the ones that are coming after me. Okay, Dusty, who do you got? We got a lot of callers, and hello there. I haven't seen you in a while. Um, Good. Jose from Wesley Chapel, Florida. Okay. Jose, how you doing? Okay. Give it to me quick. I, I, I'm doing fine, man. <laughs> Thank you for all you do, my brother, and God bless you for being out there. Chris, I'm so passionate. I am upset. We got 22 Americans that have been killed by Hamas. <clears throat> I have not heard this administration or on any network or any White House briefing say that we are going to retaliate and hit a mosque for killing Americans. All I keep hearing is about the hostages, which, right. you know, they are important, <clears throat> and we will do whatever we could with Israel to get them back. But we need to send a message to our mosque that you do not kill Americans and get away with it. We are not going to tolerate it, and we need to I hear hit you. them and hit them hard. I, I hear you. I hear you. It's complicated. Uh, you can't just go with how you feel. And it's not our fight. There are Americans involved. They're probably more dead and more taken uh, than we're being told, frankly, because they don't know. Um, but you got to be very careful, especially in this region. And you got to go slow and you got to do it the right way. Next. Uh, we're going to go to Flint from Rochester, New York. Flynn, how you doing? Uh, dittos, uh, Chris, how you doing? Uh, I'm all I'd right. Like to say what do you got? I, I'd like to say that uh, I've got no skin in the game, but uh, 2.5 uh, million Palestinians are, all don't represent uh, Hamas, and all the power, water, food, uh, electricity, medical has all been turned off to the whole country. So I really think that's a harsh thing to punish people that didn't actually have anything to do with it. I understand the goal of what we're doing, but at the same time, we want to have hearts for us. But 2.5 million people had had most of those people are probably terrorized by Hamas as well every day. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And it sucks. Uh, and there are no good answers in this situation. But we both know. If a terror organization had done this, like when they did it to 9-11, uh, cutting off power was the least of what America did in retaliation. Uh, Israel has not been hit like this in a generation. Uh, and this is an existential threat to them. But you're right. The only real hostages in this situation are the Palestinians. And they're being held hostage by Hamas. Hamas is not into this for the betterment of its people. It's in it for blood. And we're seeing that. You don't kill babies because you want progress. Next. Uh, next, we're going to go to Shelly from Richmond, Virginia. Hi, Chris. Shelly, what what's your question? Okay, what I'm concerned about, Chris, is that the hostages that are there, and when the media starts calling for what is the United States going to do, how can the United States do anything when these hostages are held in caves that have different companies <clears throat> all over uh, the Gaza Strip. How can you find these hostages yeah. when you don't know where they are? Yeah. This is this is what this is what special forces do. This is what intelligence does. Uh, I'm not calling for American boots on the ground. That's not my place. I don't even know what I would be talking about. Uh, I know where the passion comes from of why people want that, but that's different uh, than responsible action. So uh, I hear you. I understand you. These are Americans, and just like every other problem in your life, when you have something that matters to you, you do everything you can. Next. Well, let's go to break and take a couple more calls when we come back. A lot of people want to talk. We'll come back. All right, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. Okay, Dusty, who else do we have? We have Norm from Miami, Florida. Norm, what's Hello, your question? Fred. 
Uh, Chris, my question is, I was talking to a good friend of mine who's a Jewish scholar, and we were just discussing why does Israel allow Hamas to live so close to them in Gaza? Why are they still allowing that to happen? It's not under their control. Um, the, you know, the, they, have, they have certain control over the territory, but they don't have complete control. Uh, and Hamas uh, is uh, you know, a, a part of a poison element that you see in a lot of oppressed societies. Uh, the hope is that Hezbollah, which is much more organized, uh, has a lot more power within Lebanon than Hamas does in Palestine. Hopefully, Hezbollah doesn't want to lose uh, what it has, which it will, uh, if it creates this kind of second front in the war. But Hamas uh, is just a symptom of a disease. Uh, that you have of oppression and poverty that is real and has to be addressed. The suffering is real in Palestine. It's just how Hamas is harnessing it and taking advantage of it is as toxic as anything else. Dusty. Uh, we're we're going to go to Thomas from Winnemucca, Nevada, and I'm sure I said that wrong. <clears throat> Thomas, what's your question? Yes. Um... I understand, you know, the horror of, of Hamas and all that. And I'm not debating it. But my, my thing is, I'm 70 years old, <clears throat> white, Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And I remember back when President Carter pretty much forced uh, Sadat and Begin, Israel and Egypt, <clears throat> to quit shooting each other. And that has lasted. So my question is this. Why hasn't any subsequent or present 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 administration forced, pretty much forced Israel and the Palestinian people to sit down and say enough is enough and work out some kind of livable, non-aggressive agreement that we can all, they can all live with. You got to be careful about the desire for a simple solution in a complex situation. Uh, this is generations long as a problem. And I would just suggest to you this. In our own country, we can't get people who have power given to them by us to do anything in our interest other than fight with each other. Why? Because the tension works for their retention of power. You see what we're dealing with in America over nothing that distracts us from our real problems. Imagine when it's about land and blood and existential threats how hard it is to get people to move in any direction other than what they see as their own personal advantage. Dusty. Okay, this is our last caller, and her name is Suzanne from East Freedom, Pennsylvania. Okay, hi, Chris. Hi, what's your question? Well, I, I just want to say that I watch you a lot, and I'm grateful that you're there. And um, I, I think of you as more of a, uh, of a news teacher or an educator, and I value that. You add so much value to this job and this position, and I just want you to know uh, I'm just grateful for that. I've watched you more now than ever before. News Nation is very, very lucky to have you, and we're blessed that you, you do what you're doing. And I, I just wondered how you were holding up, because it cannot be easy. Um, look, that's a very generous assessment. Uh, a lot of people are doing the exact same job. They're doing it better. They've done it longer, and they put themselves in harm's way uh, as a natural part of their profession. Um, I'm just stating what's obvious here and trying to stay very steady about what we know and what we don't know and what we show and letting you make the decisions, okay? Uh, we're very fortunate to be able to do the job uh, there, but for the grace, these could be my kids. And that's the connection for me, the same as it is for you. There are Americans involved here, and they matter, and their interests should be served. And that's what this job is, and that's why I'm doing it. And I believe this situation is worth the risk um, that this presents to me. Uh, and everybody on the job makes the same determination. And our families are often not happy with it. Uh, when we went off the air before, it scares people at home, and I hate that. There's so much fear. There's so much pain. I wish there was more that we could do. But having you understand it so that you can make your own judgments and your own determinations is the only thing I can think to do right now. But my heart breaks just like yours does. Uh, this is almost unbelievably painful. Almost unbelievably painful. Hey, thank you for watching. Please go to NewsNationNow.com, NewsNationNow.com, and you can find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button down below. 
Then you will get more of News Nation's fact-driven coverage.